Okay, so uh, thank you so much for having me here today. I uh, am particularly excited because it's been, I counted, exactly 10 years since I sat in this audience as an eighth grader. It's a little alarming. <laughs> but <laughs> in those 10 years, I have faced my fair share of challenges, as I think everyone does, whatever stage of life they're in. And I have found that recognizing challenges, let alone confronting them or even trying to fix them, can feel really overwhelming. I see a challenge and I know that I tend to ask myself, should I do something about this? If I do something, will it even make a difference? Should I, should I, should I bother? And also, what is the something that I should do? And uh, I think when you recognize a challenge, and it can be you know, at any scale, and then you see yourself relative to that challenge, that's pretty scary. And it can, it can make you freeze. And that happens, you know, because challenges can come at many, many scales. For example, if you're in school, walking in the hallway, and you hear a friend make a comment, and it leaves you feeling a little bit uncomfortable. You have to decide, should I say something right now? Is that the best move? Will it make a difference? Or maybe you are at the dinner table, and you hear your family discussing some topic that has really been dividing the community. I know that happens a lot and you find out that they are going to a protest about it. And you have to decide how you want to engage. Or maybe, as a place that I am now, I've realized that there's three, four, five, ten different enormous or small challenges facing myself, facing the world, and I have to figure out how do I, you know, how do I spend my time? Where do I invest my resources? And that in itself is a challenge. That's very scary. But the fortunate thing about this, the lucky thing, is that you don't have to always come up with everything on the spot for yourself. Every time progress is made, every time action is taken, it has to be based on something that happened in the past. So for example, I currently work at Roswell in cancer research, and I am working on a study that looks at bladder cancer in western New York. When I was devising the study, when I was writing my rationale, I had to prove that I knew what I was talking about. I had to write about all the other studies that worked on a similar thing, because that's how I refined my idea. That's how I came up with something new, something that I could contribute. Something that I could figure out how I wanted to change the field. The same is true for technology. You can't just invent a computer, right? It's based on technology that has been invented over time. The same is true for philosophy. You know, you're always responding to theories, to ideas that have already existed. And I think that framework can be applied to any time that you face a challenge, any time that you have an opportunity to take change and you don't know what to do. I think you can rely on other people's ideas and experience, but importantly, I think you can also rely on your own experiences, your own past actions. When you take one small action, I think it can have an enormous ripple effect that we sometimes underestimate. So I'll give you an example from my life. This is, <laughs> this is me and my friends in seventh grade about spring, and uh, we were in a garage band at the time. That was our costume. Uh, this was one of our performances. <laughs> so around this time in seventh grade, YouTube was in its infancy. It was about two years old, and viral videos were just becoming a thing. And uh, there was a comedian named Jeff Dunham who had released, you know, he had a ton of viral videos. He was very famous, made a lot of money, and one of his videos was, was about a puppet called Ahmed the Dead Terrorist. I mean, you might have watched this. And it, I mean, everybody watched it. Everybody quoted it, including me and my friends. The thing about this video is that, you know, it was mocking Muslims. And it was probably funny. I mean, probably. He mocked a lot of groups. Offensive humor has its audience. But I, too, am Muslim. So I engaged with the video differently than my friends engaged with the video. And so, I mean, we would quote it, we would repeat lines, we would go back and forth, this went on for a long time. And I knew that, you know, maybe I didn't actually find it that funny, but that was what was funny at the time. And I made a huge mistake. I went home, and I told my mom about this video. Error. So, <laughs> she gave me an ultimatum. She told me, hey John, if you do not go into school tomorrow, tomorrow, not two days from now, tomorrow, if you don't confront your friends, I will confront your friends, I will confront your friends' parents, 
I will talk to the headmaster. I mean, it was crazy. So I had really no choices, and I summoned up all my courage, walked into school the next day. We were in math class, my favorite class. And one of my friends, as, as we did every day, quoted the video. And I kind of summoned up all my courage, and I was like, you know what? I just don't think it's that funny. Can we, uh, let's not, let's just not quote anymore. And of course, my friends were like, okay, fine. I mean, it wasn't meant to be offensive. Okay, whatever. And I moved on. So that was one moment, and it was so hard for me, but I did it. Fast forward five years since me and my friends in high school. Same friends. They're also in the audience. So, <laughs> I have other ones, too. Um, <laughs> So we were in high school, it was junior year, and once again, we were leaving math class, setting for all my stories. And uh, one of our classmates made a joke as we were walking out of class that was also about Muslims, because I'm just lucky like that. And uh, it was along the same lines as you know, a joke that Jeff Dunham made. And I remembered you know, being like, okay, here I go again. Gotta sum it up, you know, one more time, have to be the person that says, I don't think it's funny, Ran out everyone's parade, but do the right thing. Before I could open my mouth, one of my friends, who had been there in seventh grade when I had that first interaction, she said, mm, nope, we don't like jokes like that, stop. And she walked away. And I didn't have to say anything. And in that moment, I remember freezing and just being so grateful that one, she had said that, and I didn't have to. But two, it felt like what I had done in seventh grade had paid off, that that discomfort had had an effect. Um, the little action that I had taken had reverberated over time and affected someone else who maybe affected this third person. And as I was preparing this talk, I actually thought of this story first when I thought about Be the Change. And I asked that friend, do you remember either of these exchanges? Because they really impacted me. And she said, no. <laughs> She didn't remember. <laughs> but the point is, I remembered, and I, I took those with me as I moved forward. So, another five, six years went by, and I was in college, and I studied global health in college, um, which looks at sort of disease at, a, at a different levels, including a population level, and understanding different global contexts. So, in this particular project that I was working on, I was in Tanzania. And it, I was in central Tanzania in this town called Singida, and we were interviewing women in several villages outside the town. We were talking to them as we were preparing for a project. We wanted to understand the gender roles in their communities. You know, what tasks did the women perform, what did the men perform, and how did they feel about those assignments? And in between interviews, my colleagues and I were um, just standing, chatting about our lives, and one of my colleagues asked me a very personal question about my life, specific to being a woman. Something about why I wasn't married yet, or why I didn't have kids. And I was like, what? I am, I'm here as a scientist. That's the role that I'm at this, in this place right now. And it is so ironic, given what we were working on, that you would think it was appropriate to ask me this question. So I was thinking all of that. But also in that moment, I was very uncomfortable because I was in a different context. This colleague was my senior, and I didn't know, I just didn't know what to do. But I did have my own past experiences to guide me. And kind of the defining factor was that there were people standing around me. There were women, there were men, they were American, they were Tanzanian. And I knew that they were watching this interaction, so I wouldn't just be standing up for myself in that moment, but I would also potentially have an effect on the people standing around me. And I wanted them to be able to walk away using my behavior and let that be an influencing factor in their future actions. And so I did respond. I said to this person, inappropriate question, this is so irrelevant to what we're doing, and I'm here as a scientist, let's move on. And we did. And again, I don't know if that really did influence anyone else, but I know that it influenced me, and I, and I hope that it did influence other people. So, that story worked very well, right? I did, I really did something in seventh grade, and it may or may not have influenced someone else, and that may or may not have influenced another person, 
but it stayed with me for a very long time. I still think about it often, but of course, there are many times in my life and I'm sure in other people's lives where they haven't always made the exact right choice. For example, I can think of two instances in the recent past, one in which someone made a comment and brought up race, and I didn't say anything because the context, I felt so uncomfortable, and I, I let it go. And then another situation where someone brought up race at a dinner table, and I did say something immediately, kind of off the bat. And I really regret the moment where I didn't say anything, and I'm very proud of the moment where I did. But again, you know, one of them worked out, one of them didn't, but both of them were learning experiences for me, and I, br I bring that with me as I move forward. And I think that's okay. That still informs your actions. It's okay to make mistakes. But my takeaway from all of it is that when you do have an opportunity to make change, you have an opportunity to take action, whether the challenge that you're facing is, is really big or if it's very manageable, you should take it, not just for yourself in that moment and for the people around you in that moment, but you should take it for your future self and for the people around you, their future selves, so that maybe they can take that with them as they move forward. If you practice that, if you practice change, if you think of it as a muscle and you exercise it, if you stretch yourself, that means in the future you can stretch just a little bit more. And when you come up against something that feels overwhelming, that feels impossible to tackle, whether it's at a societal level or an individual level, you can look to other people. You can look to them and see what they did. But you can also look to yourself for inspiration. And I hope that everybody